Let's give it up for the band leading us in worship today. I only have four minutes to get this sermon in before kickoff. Hey, thank you guys for coming third service, even on football weekend. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, we are full up in the second service, so you guys are literally making it possible for a lot of families to experience Christ by going to the third service and the people that choose to go to the first service. So we really appreciate that. It's more life change, more growth for the kingdom of God. So thank you um, on behalf of the church. Um, next week, you'll even get to see um, all the sacrifice, what it's worth, right? Because we get to see like 40, 50 people baptized next Sunday. <laughs> I'll go ahead and do that announcement now. If you haven't signed up for baptism, next Sunday is the day. Um, we have limited space in the second service, uh, plenty of space in the first and third. So if you have never been baptized after accepting Christ as your Savior, uh, please sign up to do so. And if you have any questions about that, please ask us and we will help you um, in that process. So. Um, today we're going to be talking about the Holy Spirit, uh, a crucial building block uh, for every disciple. And I think that this is actually one of those doctrines that's a little bit misunderstood and misconstrued. Um, so there's some people that stretch the Holy Spirit uh, too far, and there's some people that constrain the Holy Spirit too much. And so um, I hope that I can share just an overview um, of how the Holy Spirit works and and uh, that part of God that we talk about the Father a lot, and we talk about Jesus a lot, but we don't, we don't really talk about the Holy Spirit um, a whole lot. Is it crucial uh, to your progression in your faith? And so today I hope that I can give you that example, and then we're going to ask two questions about three quarters of the way through the sermon, and those are going to be the ones that I need you to answer today. Um, there's going to be a passage in Ephesians 4 that talks about putting off the old man and putting on the new. And we have a choice to make. Do we want to get rid of slash throw away the old garment of who we used to be before we met Christ? And are we willing to allow the Holy Spirit to renew us day by day? And so those are the two questions that you're going to answer today. Are you willing to let go of some things? And are you willing to allow God to move in your life? Okay, so... Holy Spirit, um, as we get into this doctrine, um, I want you to know that the Holy Spirit is um, a part of God that allows us to uh, do a lot of things and has a critical role. We're going to look at four of these, but these are not uh, by any means exhaustive in all the things that the Holy Spirit does. But for a disciple, that's our goal, building better disciples. For a disciple, these are the parts that you would need to know as a crucial foundation stone for you. Number one. The Holy Spirit has a role to convict, to convict. Um, it says in John 16, 8, when he comes, he will convict the world about sin, righteousness, and judgment. So conviction, um, we would most associate with that with a feeling uh, probably of guilt. Um, for instance, there's a lot of people that are coming to our church now, and um, they're, they're feeling drawn, okay? That's another role of the Holy Spirit, but anyway... Um, but maybe you've been out of church for a long period of time, and uh, going back to church can feel a little convicting. You can feel like, man, I know I should have been in church. And you almost have, you could possibly have like a foreboding feeling of like, yeah, you know, I'm going to walk in there, and I, I know I should have been there. And it's, it's like there's a conviction that something isn't right in your life. And you're trying to get that worked out. The Holy Spirit uses that conviction. By the way, a lot of times, though, we, we kind of, um, I've noticed from a psychological perspective, we actually get some things wrong. Like if some people <laughs> haven't been at church in a while, they, they start being paranoid. And they start feeling like the greeters have like a role. And they're not going to be like, haven't seen you in a while, right? I would fire any greeter instantly that ever did that to someone. I don't know if that's ever happened at Genesis Metro Church. I don't think that it generally happens at any church, by the way. And, and I think that we start building things up in our mind about like what people are going to think. But hey, we're family. We're just happy to see you, okay? We, we want the best for your family. We want your family to get back on track. And we know that 
going to church is part of that process. And so don't ever let the stuff that's going on in your mind rule you when it comes to getting plugged back in. So the Holy Spirit uses conviction. So you'll be sitting in a sermon, right? Or sometimes it could be a song that we're worshiping to. And you start feeling some anxiety. You start feeling something inside of you saying, hey, this, this is for you. I, I, maybe there's a change that needs to, to be made. And now there's going to be a wrestling match, right? There's a wrestling match inside of your heart, inside your mind. Like, oh, you know, I'm, uh, maybe he's talking to somebody else. No, guess what? I'm talking to you, okay? So the Holy Spirit convicts. And it's interesting even how the Holy Spirit uh, convicts people because sometimes people will come to me after a sermon and they'll be like, you know, hey, you know, thanks for preaching that. This is what I got out of that. And they'll start saying what they got out of it. I did not preach that at all. Not at all. And what, what happens is, is that they're not, they're not making that up, though. The Holy Spirit translated what I was saying to what they needed. And that's how dynamic God is, is that you can go to, to, a, to a sermon. It could be about whatever, tithing, and next thing you know, you need, to, you need to learn how to pray better, you know? How did that happen? Well, God translated that to where you were, and the Bible says that his word is alive, right? It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It's able to divide. It's able to discern. And so today, um, if God starts speaking to you, I would say uh, quit resisting that, right? That that conviction is good. We need to have some conviction. We don't need to feel good when we're doing wrong, right? We don't need to feel good when we're walking in the wrong direction. God's trying to keep us from that, so he brings conviction. Sometimes you'll, you, you'll get into a conversation, or you'll get into some, you know, maybe road rage, whatever it may be, and like, you ever have that voice like, hey, uh, a little too far, right? Like, hey, you, you probably should stop. Like, I know that for me, I start joking, you know, and next thing you know, people are laughing, so I just want to keep going further, you know, and then the Holy Spirit's like, too far, Tim, too far. Just walk it back. And so, you know, that's the Holy Spirit. You should learn to trust that, right? Trust that the God is convicting you, not to make you feel bad about yourself, but to keep you from doing dumb things, okay? So conviction, uh, number one role of the Holy Spirit. So he convicts us to move towards God um, so that we can avoid, uh, at the end of the day, the judgment of God. And then number two, he has a role to make us alive. He's the active part of the Godhead that makes us alive. And John chapter 6, verse 63, it says the spirit is the one who gives life. The flesh doesn't help at all. And if you go back to John 3, there was a conversation with Nicodemus, and he was explaining this in further detail. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, or we would say natural birth. And then he says, that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Now, some of you, you might say, this is elementary. I promise you, there's a lot of people in here that they are new to church, okay? I was not raised in church. And I, I realized there's like a whole nother language that church people speak. And, and you don't even know you're speaking it. But you're saying things and the person that's not in church is like, what are you talking about? Like, we say you got to be born again, you know? And people that aren't, aren't raised, like, what is that, you know? Uh, so born again, saved, born of the Spirit, uh, becoming a Christian, these are all synonymous terms, okay? So the Holy Spirit's role is that God draws all men to himself. It says even creation. So if you're ever wondering about the person that's, in a far remote place. It says, even creation bears witness. It testifies that there is a God so that man will be without excuse. So no one's ever gonna stand before God and he's gonna play the gotcha game. We're like, huh, well, you weren't raised in the Bible Belt, so you're going to hell, okay? It says that the Spirit plays a part in that, that he draws people, he convicts people of what truth is, and then we make a volitional choice, which we'll get to in the next one. So, if the role of the Holy Spirit is to convict, and then um, we're talking about, I forgot there, so to make alive. So whenever it comes to him making us alive, it says that he re, he's the part that regenerates us. And so when we say born of the Spirit, it means that the Spirit um, takes and, and makes us alive to God. So in your, if you could 
deconstruct your body, okay, there would be a part of you that is your spirit, okay? And that's the thing that he makes alive unto him. So man has a lot of different parts, according to the Bible, that uh, can, cannot be seen, if you will, like the mind cannot be seen. You have a brain, but that's not your mind. And so you have an intellect, um, and so there's different parts of you, your soul, your mind, your body. And so the part that God saves, that he, the Holy Spirit regenerates, is your spirit, okay? So that's the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, he has the, the B side of that verse. If you would put it back up on the screen, please. It says that the flesh is of no use. Now, now this is where uh, we got to separate some stuff out, okay? Because most unchurched people and, I would say, a fair amount of church people, and that's all church. When I say church, I'm talking Catholic, Methodist, all of them, okay? Um, they have a belief in a cosmic scale of good and bad, okay? And they believe when they die, if their good outweighs their bad, then that's how they will go to heaven, okay? Now, that could not be further <laughs> from what the Bible teaches, but it's, it's just a form of belief that arises, and... and <laughs> And some of it is where culture, um, like American culture, is kind of involved here. See, in America, we believe, or we, we were founded on, and, and rugged individualism, which means that um, the, the American dream is that you can come to America from any place in the world and that you can arrive and you can accomplish great things if you work hard and put your mind to it, which has birthed the greatest country in the history of the world. But sometimes when you try to confer or conflate your individualism into your faith, that's, 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 not, that's not the case, okay? You cannot do Christianity on your own. You cannot do that. You cannot even save yourself, okay? So the Bible says that our goodness is like filthy rags, that we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. All of us, if we're measuring out how good we are compared to how bad we are, our bad far outweighs our good. As a matter of fact, it calls it debt, that the wages of sin, that's our debt, is death. We've earned death through our sins. And so we needed a God who was capable of paying for our sins. And so it says that your flesh is of no value. So in other words, if you try to be as good as you could possibly be for the rest of your life, apart from Christ, your bad would still, you would, like you're building a ladder, okay? You would never get enough rungs to get to heaven, okay? Every time you sin, the Bible says we become guilty, and that's the conviction. And so we need to be forgiven of our sin. So if you are ever thinking that your good needs to outweigh the bad, also the amount of pressure, can you imagine the amount of pressure you are under that every day, if you're not good enough, if you were in a car accident and you died on one of your bad days, you would go to hell? I, I would hope that you don't want that system, man. Every time you get in a fight and you say something ugly to your spouse, if you like had a stroke, you stroked out right there, like you, nah, you lost, I mean, you're gone. And it's like, you don't want a system that is dependent on you. You're fragile, okay? God is not. God is eternal. And so we want to build our faith on something that is secure. So he says that he convicts and then he makes us alive. And then we're going to see also he secures and seals. Now, before I read this verse, I want you to know that, as I said, we have a lot of people that are guests, a lot of people that are new to Genesis Metro. You're filling it out, shopping, if you will. Uh, what's it going to take to put you in this church? Anyway, um, and so, so whenever you're thinking about that, you need to know what a church believes, okay? Now, Genesis Metro is a non-denominational church, but we have some distinctives. As a matter of fact, I would say this one I'm going to preach on right now is our sole distinctive, a hill to die on. Like, I will go out in the parking lot and I will fight you over this doctrine, okay? So, it's important that you know whether or not you agree with us. And I'm, if I was really couching that, I'd say whether or not you agree with the Bible. But, that would be unfair and heavy-handed. Um, so, so, whether or not your salvation is secure is incredibly important. And when I go through this doctrine, 
I don't want to debate what you've been taught. I want to debate what the Bible says, okay? So you can disagree with the Bible, but I, I, would, I would just encourage you as a believer to embrace it, okay? So we're going to read this, okay? We're going to read this. And if you've come from a, a church that teaches a form of works-based salvation, I should have already defeated that with the your flesh is of no value. But if I didn't, um, I want to go through this one. And I, my goal is not to come across like uh, I can out-debate your belief. My goal is I want you to feel confident. I want you to experience the love of God and be secure. Because if, if, you, if people treated marriage like they treat their relationship with God, if they felt like every time someone got into an argument, they were going to walk out and leave them forever, that would be a very insecure relationship. And that's the way some people treat the salvation of God. And I think God loves us better than any human ever could. So here we go. I set it up enough. In him, you also, when you heard the word of truth, okay, so there's the word of truth. It's being preached. Uh, the gospel of your salvation, you believed, okay? So there we have a volitional choice, all right? So, so you, God draws, but then you have to decide. What are you going to do? with the truth that's being presented to you. He says, but you believed in him and were sealed. Now, if I wanted to nerd out, which I'm gonna save my nerding out to the end of the sermon, I would tell you that this word sealed in the construction of the Greek, this is gonna be in a, in a perfect tense to where it has a, it has a action that is decided and then it is permanent, okay? So even in the language, I'm just gonna tell you there's no way out of this, but we can just use the English for today's translation, but it says, they were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, okay? Uh, with the promised Holy Spirit, um, who is the, we'll say this word together on the count of three. One, two, three, guarantee. Let's say it again. One, two, three, guarantee. Okay, so you believed and you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance. What is our inheritance? Our inheritance is Christ. Our inheritance is heaven until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So God said he's willing to guarantee your salvation with the sealing of the Holy Spirit. Now you tell me if God says he guarantees it and there was some loophole that allowed you to lose it, then was it guaranteed? Think about that for a moment. In order for you to lose your salvation, God's guarantee would have to be no good. So he says that he seals us. We have a choice in the salvation. We do not have a choice to be unsealed. <laughs> Once he seals it, it's sealed. And he says that's the guarantee till we inherit. Now, I'm not going to get into this part of it, but when does that happen? That happens at the end. So 1 Corinthians 15 talks about this mortal shall put on immortality, that the dead shall be raised and those are alive shall be caught up to reign with him forevermore. And so um, that's, that's when we inherit. So he said, in, this, in the meantime, for safekeeping, I have sealed you. Now, trust me, I'm a pastor, right? And that means shepherd. And you guys are my sheep, right? But I can't be with you all the time. And you have a tendency to wander off. Did you guys know that? You guys just wander around. You start wandering towards a ditch. You start wandering towards the cliff, like hanging out with wolves, okay? And so, so what does God give us to make sure that we're safe? At the end of the day, he seals us with his Holy Spirit because he says, you're no good on your own. None of us are, right? We're not good on our own. And so we need something to guide us and we need something to help us. Now, wouldn't you walk more confidently in the Lord if you knew your salvation was secure? Absolutely. Now, it doesn't mean you get to take advantage of it because the people that are on the other side of this argument are like, well, so you can say I can do anything? Well, in theory, yes. But in practicality, no. Because it says that if you abuse the grace of God, you should really consider whether or not the root of Christ was ever in you. So change should result. Because James says that a faith that doesn't produce something is dead. So you would say, check the root, because there ain't no fruit. Probably ain't no root. Anyway, uh, so the Holy Spirit, yeah, I know, I'm on a heater today. Uh, <laughs> he convicts, he makes alive, he secures, he seals, and then the last one, he guides, okay? He guides us. It says in John 16, 13, when the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you 
into all the truth, into all the truth. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a little time on this one because this is where, again, some people <laughs> abuse the spirit, okay? Um, have you ever had or heard someone, they walk up to you and they say, I have a, I have a word, I have a word from the Lord. Has anybody ever heard that phrase? Anybody ever? Okay, so I'm going to tell you something about me. Uh, I am a natural born skeptic. Do I have any other skeptics in the room? Yes. Corey, I know you're a skeptic. Um, I just want to say I embrace you as brothers and sisters. I just welcome to the skeptic club, okay? Whenever someone says that to me, my natural radar of red light flashing, okay? Bad, like, so, like bad, 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 bad. Now, I want to say, if you ever come up to me and say that, I'm not judging you, but I am not going to naturally trust you, especially if I've never talked to you. Like, you're not my Holy Spirit, right? And so people will say they have a word, but then their word is not tangent to nor founded in the word of God. Now, you get into some dangerous ground here, because if you read down there those last chapters in Revelation, it says that if you add anything to my word, then I will add to you the plagues that are written in that word. And if you read some of those plagues, you don't want none of that. You do, you do not want that. There's like scorpions that sting people and they writhe on the ground. You don't, want, you don't want that. And then it says if you take away part of my words, he goes, I'll take your name out of the book of life. It's like God like, boom, out, done, seal, boom, gone. Uh, like you don't want that either, right? So if he says you can't add to it, and he says you can't take away, what would that suggest about God's word? That it's perfect, that it's complete. He even says that about its own self, that God's word is thorough, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished to every good work, that we have an answer to every question, every objection, that we have something to solidify, something to fortify, that God's word is in of itself complete and has all the answers that we need to live the Christian life. So when the, someone comes to me and says, I have a word for you, and it's not founded in the word, do you think the Holy Spirit would ever lead you to lead me contrary to something that's already in the written word? Do you see what I'm saying? So when someone's preaching up here, and they start preaching their opinion, instead of preaching from God's word, should you want to be involved in any of that? No. If I was shopping a church and the guy got up and talked about self-help and talked about, you know, Zig Ziglar and, and no, all good things, but you know, Zig Ziglar can't save me, right? John MacArthur can't save me. Uh, John Maxwell can't save me. And so God can save me. So I should preach from the book, not a person who wrote a book about the book. You see what I'm saying? So the Holy Spirit, if they say, I have a word for you, it has to be rooted in God's word, or I would say reject it out of hand, all right? They are not your Holy Spirit. Your mama is not your Holy Spirit, okay? Your crazy aunt is not your Holy Spirit, okay? The Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit, and he says that he leads us into truth. What is the truth? The truth is God's word. See how it's a perfect circle, right? Perfect circle. So anything that's outside of that circle, I would tell you, you should be a skeptic, and I would personally reject anyone that says that they have a word for me that is outside of the word. So that is four things that the Holy Spirit does. He's trying to guide you this morning. So whenever you come into church, he starts to try to guide you. Like, is there an area of your life that needs correction? Is there an area of your life that needs improvement? The Holy Spirit is your guide. So our main passage today is Ephesians chapter 4, and we're going to answer those two questions now. Is there something you need to put off or remove? Is there something that you need to renew? He says in Ephesians chapter 4 that this is not how you came to know Christ. Now, this sounds like it's kind of right in the middle of something. Um, and again, on Sunday mornings, I, I will never have enough time to do all of this in one Sunday. But he's talking about the Gentiles here and how the Gentiles are naturally pagans. And by the way, if you're not a Jewish person, you're a Gentile. This is another one of those code words. People walk into church. They've never been in church before. Like, hey, you're a Gentile. Like, what? I'm Italian. And so, uh, so 
from a Jewish person in the Bible times perspective, you are a Gentile pagan. We're all pagans sitting in here, okay? He said, but the Gentiles were darkened in their mind, so they'd given themselves up to all kinds of, of sinful desires. He says, but that's not how you came to know Christ. So you are not that way if you are following after Christ. So you've separated yourself, if you will, which is what holiness means. So verse 21, assuming you heard about him and were taught by him as the truth is in Jesus, to take off your former way of life, the old self that is corrupted by deceitful desires. So he says, in order to follow after Christ, there's part of you that is gonna have to be taken off. And so there's lots of things that are said in our culture that they sound clever and cliche, but they're not good theology. Uh, for instance, uh, when it says, have you ever heard somebody say like uh, marriage isn't 50-50, it's 100-100? Has anybody ever, said, anybody ever heard that? That's a clever saying. And I know what they're trying to say, but when I do premarital counseling, I don't, I don't want you to bring 100% of you into the marriage. Did you, did you know that? Did you know that you have some bad habits? Does anybody know that? Like you have some ego issues, you have some anger issues, maybe some of you have jealousy issues, insecurity issues. Do you want to bring that into the rest of your life? Does that sound like till death do us part, happily ever after? No, that sounds like a life sentence. Like they put you in prison, right? So it's not, it's not all of you. I don't want to fit all of you. I want, I don't, matter of fact, you hear people say this all the time. You hear like, well, that's just, that's just who I am. That's just who I am. And that doesn't sound like, just on its face, the biggest justification for not wanting to change. When you say, that's who I am. God is not trying to make you the best version of you. Did you know that? That's Oprah, okay? <laughs> He's trying to make you more like Christ. That's the goal. Did you know that? Like Christianity, it's in the name. They put it there. To be more like Christ. But I think that sometimes we've co-opted Christianity into saying, like, how can God make me better? How can God make me better? And we're trying to use God to make my life better instead of trying to use my life to make God's kingdom greater. You see, that's, there's a very, different, a very different mentality in which one you're embracing. So the Holy Spirit... It says through Paul that you have to put off this old self. That we're not trying to keep you. We're trying to get God. Now, you'll still be your personality type, but tempered with the Holy Spirit. So he says that you got to put off that old self in order to move forward because you have this corrupting desire. So I wanted to talk about the three things that drive that old self. Okay? Your old you. And he said it's, it's corrupting, and that corrupting word is, is kind of like um, uh, if you've had a, a phone for too long and it starts, starts like closing apps like randomly. Has anybody ever had this? Like you're, you like go to open it and you do something and like it's like, uh, like restart, or reboot. Like it's, it's like it's got old and it gets corrupt over time. Or if you have clothes that have been in the closet, they start to, you know, get a little holes in them or they start to fade. It's like that's, that's this garment that we naturally are being corrupted by three things. So the three things that drive that old self. Number one, Satan, okay? Satan and demonic or spiritual forces in dark places. In Ephesians 6, it says, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against spiritual wickedness, darkness, high places. In other words, there's a spiritual battle going on. I think I have a picture um, here, and I, this is how I'll, I will liken this example. Um, if you've ever seen uh, this resistance band running, has anybody ever seen this, right? I just want you to know I have a, a, a sick personality. I like to watch the people that fail at this. I don't know if you've ever seen one snap. that They get way out there. It's like, pow! And like, oh! And, um, or the person gets to run in, and they lift up, and it just like snaps them backwards. I don't know why I enjoy other people's pain. It's probably sinful, um, but I do. I, I enjoy it. Um, but I want you to imagine that that guy is attached to the floor, it looks like right there. But just imagine that, like, that floor is, is Satan, okay? That I think a lot of Christians, it's not an effort issue. I think you're trying to run. It's like you are, 
you know, you're doing it. But then you like you feel like you're hitting this wall and you feel like oh, I can't progress. And then if you let up any, right, that force keeps pulling you back so that you're never gaining any ground. Most Christians do not live as if there is a spiritual force that's against them. And can I tell you that this guy, this power, Satan, darkness, it's actually stronger than you are. It's way smarter than you are. As a matter of fact, no person has ever beat this enemy. They are undefeated. So if you wake up every day in neutral, if you, wake, just, if you just get up and you're like, ah, you know what, I'm just gonna go about my day to day, you're gonna lose. That force is pulling you. So if you're not resisting it, it's pulling you. So the only way to ultimately get further ahead is to cut the things, to take off the old self that is binding us. Not only do we have spiritual forces that are trying to hold us back, the Bible says we have a sin nature, okay? We have a sin nature. So we have an enemy on the outside, but we also have an enemy on the inside. And it says that Adam sinned, and therefore we all sin. And James says that the process of sin is that our lust or desire that's against God conceives and it brings forth sin, and that sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. So a misnomer um, in, in Christianity or in the average church world is that they, they fundamentally don't understand or maybe they don't believe that we are sinners when we were born. In other words, my granddaughter, she's so sweet, right? Her name is Dakota. If you haven't met her, I should have a picture. It's like, whoa. But she's, uh, I think, five months old, you know? And, and everyone would look at this little baby and they're like, oh, look at her. You know, all those noises that you make? I'm like, look at, look at. And, and you say, look how innocent. Look how innocent. But the reality is, that's just a little bitty sinner. Just a little bitty. Okay? And the older they get, the more the, it's evident, right? You ever had a two-year-old? Anyone ever had a two-year-old? Did you teach them to do all that? They, they are inventive, right? And then they progress all the way to apex teenager sinner, okay? I'm not saying you can't get further into sin in your 20s. Some of you did. But I'm just saying that we do not become sinners. It's, some people think like you catch it. It's like, you know, I was around a bunch of sinners and I caught it, you know. But we are born sinners. We have a natural desire. The Bible calls it our, our flesh. Um, it calls it our old self or old man. Uh, there's a lot of words it uses for it. But it's just talking about that we have a nature that is contrary to God, that we inherited in our DNA from Adam. And it says, because Adam sinned, so death passed upon all mankind. So we are all born sinners, and then the resistance is through meeting God. The resistance is through the Holy Spirit convicting us, quickening us, sealing us, and then guiding us into all truth. That's the only way we throw off this sin nature. As a matter of fact, I'll illustrate it uh, for you this way. Uh, my doctor... You know, as I get older, I got to go to the doctor, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she was like, Tim, you know, just to, you know, be on the safe side, I have the mild high blood pressure, and I had to do a heart scan, and she's like, I'm going to put you on Mediterranean diet, you know? Now, do, do I look like a person who wants to eat a Mediterranean diet? <laughs> now, I agree, just like all good patients with her. I'm like, yes, I will do that, okay? So my desire is to obey when I'm with the doctor. But then I'll be at home, okay? And like a siren in the night, a mistress, if you will, Keynes starts beckoning me, right? <laughs> and, and, and I'm not, I don't feel like I'm even choosing. I feel like it's choosing for me. And I start just moving towards my car and I get in my car and it knows the way. It's like a Tesla, it's like self-driving. And then I get there, and the person is always so friendly. You know what they say to me? Hey, 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 want some chicken today? And I'm like, yes, I do. Yes, I do. Thank you so much. You, you, you know me. 
you. And I don't even get the slaw. I don't even know who, who eats the slaw. No, I get extra sauce. You can replace that, no extra cost. And then I get Bob bread. And if you don't know Bob bread, then you haven't lived. It's buttered on both sides, okay? Say Bob, Bob bread, okay? You die twice as fast. <laughs> so I've been directed to eat a certain way. I acknowledge that the way that the doctor wants me to go is the right way. I will live longer as a result of being a good patient and obeying her word. And yet, my flesh wants something else. So you need to think about that. If we take that funny example, transpose it into these other areas. God's word says, don't do that. Don't date that. Don't marry that. Don't work there. Don't go with your coworkers out that place. And inherently, when I preach it in here, you're like, yes, pastor, yes, pastor, yes, pastor. I'll be a good sheep. I'll stay in the fence. And then you get out there. And some of us, that old person, right, those old desires, if you don't fight, then they start pulling you. And it's like you're on autopilot. As a matter of fact, the book of Proverbs talks about sexual temptation for a man. He says, like an ox to the slaughter. Whenever they engage with the wrong type of woman, he said, he doesn't even know that her footsteps lead down to death. Now, did he intend that? No, he didn't intend that. He let his old self autopilot him to his destruction. Have you ever heard someone say, it just happened? Yeah, your sinful desire will just happen if you don't resist it, if you don't follow the Holy Spirit. So we have an enemy on the outside, we have an enemy on the inside, and then we have one other driving factor, and that is the world, okay? The weight of the world. In James 4, 4, now James is a fire brimstone guy, so he just like shoots it right out there. This is how he preached. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity or opposition against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Can that be any more clear? John, 1 John 2, 5 through, 15 through 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, this is right there. Read it, okay? Don't, don't get mad at me. Read it. He says the love of of the Father is not in it. Remember we said, uh, if you're saved, you're saying, can you do anything? Well, it doesn't appear that if you're saved, you could do anything. Sounds like you might not want to do those things. Sounds like if you do those things, that the love of the Father isn't in you. He says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. Now, this is very tricky. This is going to be the most important thing I say today. So listen, take note. Christianity today is at more is in more conflict with our culture than has ever been in the history of our country. Our country was founded as a Judeo-Christian nation. Everything in our constitution, the Declaration of Independence, everything that holds our country together was founded upon this belief that God is sovereign and that God has guided us to be the nation that we are. And now we have a culture that wants to remove the foundation and just have all the freedoms that we possess. I think you're going to find that when you remove the foundations and people start using the freedoms for self-furtherance, then it becomes a corrupt system. So where, where does that, Tim, what are you talking about? How does this have to do with the Holy Spirit? You're talking about America. Okay. There used to be separation of church and... Now, if you go back and look at the intent of our founding fathers, it wasn't so that no God was in government. It was so that no government was in God. They didn't want a state-run church because they came from the Church of England. So they didn't want the government to say you have to be a Quaker, you have to be a Puritan. But all of these states, which were called colonies at the time, 
I think in 12 of the 13, you had to have a profession that you believed in Jesus in order to be in government. There was no confusion as to whether or not God played a role in this government. Now we've flipped it, okay? We've flipped it. Now, where does this have to do with the weight of the world and being friends of the world? Well, see, as believers in a modern-day church, we believe, obviously, that Jesus loved all sinners. Does everybody, does everybody agree? Because the Bible says it, okay? So I don't care if you do agree, but it's in the Bible. Jesus loved every single sinner, and he loved them enough, right, to die on a cross. Therefore, we should love sinners. That's what our church does. It doesn't matter what sin you brought in here, we love you. No matter what you've done in your past, we love you. Everyone is entitled to a seat at the table of truth so that they can experience the same life change that everyone else had an opportunity. In any church that tries to ban people from walking in and receiving that truth, that church is not under control of the Holy Spirit. So this is where it gets tricky though, right? Because now Christians, because we're so nice, we've, we've kind of moved it to a little bit of Okay, well, I'm going to embrace this world system because I'm trying to love sinners towards Jesus. Can you see where this gets tricky? Because, like, if you embrace the world system, then you're rejecting God's word. So then there has to be this space that we occupy where we are light, where we reflect truth, and yet we love Someone enough to get them to Jesus. And that's where I'm going to tell you is your challenge. That's your challenge. That the weight of the world is trying to crush you and say, if you don't endorse all of these things, then you don't love Jesus because Jesus loved everyone. Jesus had a standard, though. Jesus said these words. Jesus talked about these things. So it's one thing for me to say I love you, but if you say, Tim, then therefore do you embrace all of my ideology? No. No, I reject anything that's not in his word. The word is my guy. I love you, but I do, I do not accept your philosophy that's not rooted in God's truth. So that's the space that Christians have to occupy. Now you say, Tim, if I take that position against... Uh, a person who is not pliable or open to God's truth, then isn't that going to burn a bridge? Isn't that going to cost? The answer is yes. If you thought that your Christianity wasn't going to cost you anything, then you are not reading the Bible. Jesus loved every person that he ever came in contact with, cost him his life. He said, if you love me, then the world will hate you. So you, you can't have it that you are liked. If, if your desire is to be liked by the world, there's no way you can love God because they won't allow you to. So then you're going to have to choose, right? You have to choose. Do I want to be loved by the world or do I want to love God? And if you love God, it means that you're going to have to be against that you're going to have to stand in opposition, even if it costs you. And I think a lot of Christians today, they are not willing to lose. They're not willing to lose things. Not willing to lose their job. Not willing to lose some relationships. They would rather just compromise. And all I'm trying to get you to say, all I'm trying to get you to see is that I think that God is worth it. I think whatever you lose loving God, that God rewards and blesses more than whatever that loss is. And so, if we're going to be different as salt and light, then we can't embrace world, worldly ideology. So, maybe you can start thinking. If you're going to put off that old man, it probably means some of your old ideas, especially if you're new to this, new to church, you probably had some presuppositions that you've always assumed all your life. But now they're coming in contact with God's word. Holy Spirit is saying, mm, I don't think you're right on that. Are you willing to change? Last point, you must let the Spirit renew your spirit. Ephesians chapter 4 says, to be renewed 
in the spirit and the attitude of your minds to put on the new self, the one created according to God's likeness and righteousness and purity. And the last word, truth. Isn't it amazing how truth just gets sprinkled all through here? It's almost like Jesus is the way the truth. Okay, yeah. It's like, you know, whatever's true, think on these. Anyway, um, there's a lot of truth in the Bible. So the one thing I learned this week, and I hope that's enough to hold your attention this last three minutes. Um, after preaching for 30 years, I learned something this week. I always thought that this word, renewed, was the same word as the one that's in Romans 12, 1 and 2, where it says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Um, but when I read it, I was like, oh, that's not what that's saying. I also uh, thought that was like capital S spirit. Uh, so you'll see that it's, it's talking about your spirit inside of you, not the Holy Spirit. So he says that your spirit needs to be renewed. Now, from earlier scriptures, we know that the Holy Spirit is the one that renews that spirit. But what I learned was I thought when I preached Ephesians 1.13 that God says that our spirit, that part of us that's eternal, is sealed at the moment of belief with God's spirit. I thought they were fused. I thought they, they became one in my mind. I don't, no one ever said that to me. I just, just assumed it. That God, like, I just like, his Holy Spirit is inside of me and my spirit. But the truth is, if you think of it as concentric circles, it's like draw a big circle around your spirit. And when you're sealed, the Holy Spirit is around your spirit. But your spirit is still intact. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor Tim? Well, Romans 8, 16 says that the spirit, Holy Spirit, bears witness to my spirit. Two separate entities, okay? Now, why is this important? The word renew here means to make young again. Now, Frisco, Texas. <laughs> we, are do we are paying some money to stay young. Does anybody <laughs> preach? Like, does anybody, like, you know, like my wife has all these little things. She's like, boop, boop, boop. You know, does anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, like I even wear these little things because my eyes get really dark. They're like little wings that I put on my face. I look like an idiot, right? And if you ask me, would I ever do something like that? No, I would say no. I'm trying to renew it. I'm trying to hold on, right? My body's like not holding on with me, I feel like. And we do all these things to renew, right? We do all these things. Like when you're stressed out, you say, I need to go home and I need to veg out or I need to play or I need to go on, get on a vacation or I need to go on a walk, get outside. Whatever we do, we know naturally we need to renew ourselves. And I'll guarantee you, if you're a person that has no renewal plan in your life, you are not a fun person. You are not. You are a miserable curmudgeon. That's what you are. I guarantee you are stress-filled and you are no fun to be around. As a matter of fact, I wish some of you could sometimes see from my perspective what you look like when I'm preaching to you. I wish you could, you know? I'm preaching to an unfriendly face. That's what I am. You're like, that was not funny. On to the next one. Come on. Now, he says here that there's a way to be renewed. The further you get away from God, the more dead you feel, the more lifeless you feel. As a matter of fact, I will guarantee you, some of you have already experienced this today, the Holy Spirit, and you didn't even know it. You got here in the parking lot, and you were fussing, you were fighting, something was on your mind, someone had already driven you crazy, you'd already checked your social media, maybe someone didn't like your post. Anyway... And then you got to the door and someone was there. Welcome to Genesis Metro. And they opened this door for you. And a little bit of life crept in your curmudgeon heart. A little bit. You're like, well, that felt good. Then you stopped by the coffee bar and coffee, close to Holy Spirit. Get a little coffee in you. Start feeling a little bit better. Then you walk in here and they start playing the songs. And you don't even know the songs because you're new. Okay? But there's something. You're like, it feels Something feels, like this feels like kind of alive, you know? It's kind of looking around. Like people are, these, these people are right. They're, they're into this, right? They're not playing around here. They're singing these songs. And you're starting to feel a little lighter, right? You're starting to feel a little freer. Some of you might even get to the place, you boldly high-five Jesus in a song. And I know some of you, you're like, you're like, Tim, that's not the way I worship. And I used to say, you know, that's okay. We all worship the same way. Well, hear me when I say this. No, it's not. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. You are the same person in about 25 minutes when you get home and your team scores. You'll be like, touchdown, touchdown, woo! 
yeah, yeah. And you'll do these little things. You'll do these weird. Bring the same energy to God's house, all right? Don't, don't tell me. Don't tell me you're not that type of, I'm not that type of worshiper. When your team scores, you're not like. No. No, that is not true. What I'm trying to say is that when you put on that new self, it says that you have to be renewed. It says to be renewed. That means you can't do it. Your choice in the matter is are you going to allow God's spirit to renew, rejuvenate your spirit? That when we come in here to worship, the reason why you feel that way, the reason why you feel fresh, the reason why you feel alive is because your spirit is resonating with God's spirit and you're allowing him to move in your life and he's refreshing, he's making you new. It's like your brand, you're able to wash away the scars, the bitterness and the brokenness You allow God's spirit to do that. That's how you renew your mind. You renew your spirit. You renew the effervescence of your life. But if you sit there and you resist, as many of you do, then all of a sudden you walk away and you got the same weight. You got the same heaviness because that old self is going to keep holding you down. If you want to know how to get ahead, you want to know how to move forward, let God. Let God work in your life. And when he sets you free, you will be free indeed. Let's pray. Father, we ask on this hallowed kickoff Sunday that you would allow the spirit to move inside of our church. And maybe someone here today is hearing this for the very first time, that they would be convicted of their sin that they would allow the Spirit to move and they would receive and choose Jesus as their Savior. And they would be made alive. And God, we could change eternity in here this morning if someone would accept Christ. God, for all of the believers in the house, they might be wrestling with something. They might be trying to decide between good and evil. They might be trying to decide between good and God, good and God's best. I pray, God, that your spirit might guide them into all things. If you're wrestling inside your relationships, I promise you, if you both were yielding to God, you'd find peace at the end of that struggle. But if you choose to do you, and you choose to, whatever you are, whatever you, the way you've always been, the way you've always done, I can promise you conflict. I can promise you heartache. I can promise you you're gonna be going backwards instead of forwards. So today, God, we want to choose to cast off our old self. There's nothing about him or her that we need to keep. And God, we choose to allow you to work in our lives through this next worship song. I promise you, you receive that today, you'll sing like you've never sang before. Would you stand and worship with us?